Louis Giordano, welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And I'm thankful that you invited me and I will be happy to share the few things I have learned along these years. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we were just um, talking about our, our, both our histories, your Italian heritage via Argentina and my Irish heritage as well. So well, let's, um, let's start by going back there. Um, obviously, you're ba- actually, you know what we'll do? Let's, uh, let's introduce yourself first, Louis. Give us a, a quick idea of where you're at now in the US and who you're working for and what position. Sure. Um, well, my name is Luis Giordano. Uh, like you very well said, I was uh, born in uh, Argentina. I grew up there. Uh, right now, we are in uh, Newport Beach, California. Uh, there is where our offices, uh, Southern California offices are. I work for McCarthy Building Companies in a position of uh, pre-construction director. Uh, I've been here with McCarthy for, I lost count, but uh, more than seven years, yes. It's going to be eight next March. I joined the company as a pre-con manager, now I'm a pre-construction director, and who knows where I will be. <laughs> Very good. You're, you're on the right road, the, the upward trajectory. I hope so. <laughs> Very good. Luis, so give us an idea. We, we talked about your history, but I want to kind of go back through it a little bit, not too much um, for the listeners. Uh, Argentina, 1994, civil engineer and master's. Can you bring yourself back to then? And what was the plans uh, during that course or during the masters? Had you always got this this idea of coming to the U.S. or maybe going to Europe? What was going through your mind? Well, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> that was not my plan. In fact, growing up, I wanted to be a, an aeronautical engineer. Oh, very good. Uh, and then, you know. Talking with friends, some people I knew, what was going to be the 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 work market in Argentina? Unless you work for the military, there was not many options. Somebody that was going to high school with me was civil engineer. Started that, I liked it thankfully. And the programs are completely different uh, in Argentina than what they are here. Uh, civil engineer is. Um, a bachelor degree, you do four years in Argentina. Now it changed. Okay. I was the last year that it was a six year um, career. And we had the old style civil engineer that knew basically everything from the basic engineering to hydraulic engineering, uh, geology, um, structural calculations, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the old degree. So. Being in college, I had a friend that um, was working, he knew somebody, and he offered me one of those periods in my country where things were not going well, strikes, school was slowing down, do you want to start working? And I did. So this was uh, a small concrete uh, subcontractor that were, that, uh, were doing um, concrete structure for high rise buildings, apartment buildings. I studied there in the field as a, well, he will be a foreman superintendent. I, you know, you're still almost out of college. You think you know absolutely everything <laughs> to the field and you get completely creamed and crushed <laughs> by reality, uh... by a lot of people that have been there forever they had spent their life and this kid comes there and tell them what to do i i I can i believe i'll I'll risk to say that it was the richest professional experience i ever had yeah Uh, and and we we can come back to that but i I worked there for five years so i started like that and then ended up being like a pm running different jobs and um, and I really love the feel. I love the relationship with people. And then uh, again, you think you know, but you start working you, the, with the experience, and you start thinking about different things. The situation there changed, and then I had a period in which 
really was like two years, two, three years that I did the, the only period where I worked as a civil engineer doing surveys while I was working for a home builder doing track homes. Yeah. And um, I did that for like, yeah, almost two years and a half, three years. And then I got hired by uh, a, a developer, a, a holding in Argentina that happened to have a lot of assets in construction, but construction was not the only thing they were doing. So um, in that period, I had the opportunity to have a taste of the business side of construction. I, I was working as what here will be a CM, but with more operational duties. Okay. Because all the work they were doing, it was run as a multi-prime okay. that I don't wish anybody. <laughs> Because basically you you are on the owner's side, but you're running work. Yes. Right? Yes. So and you're running 30 people, 30 yeah. companies yourself. And it's not like here that you have all the structure, you have your PM, you have your project engineer, you have your admin. That that doesn't work like that. <laughs> it's something you're running. But um, that was also an amazing experience because it was a completely different side and perspective of construction. I got to learn, like I said, the business side, and not, not only in the relationship with consultants, with engineers, architects, um, but also with the financial side yes. uh, that I, I, I had in my hands. So this, this company, um, they, they they were big in business. They really care about doing, and, and the diversity in construction, they went from gated communities to apartment buildings, high rise office buildings. And so, okay, here's the idea. You talk to the architect, you develop everything, you start infrastructure, you build what is in there. And I need wow. to make money. Wow. That's, that's the goal. That so and you're coming with the civil, with the, with the field, like doing concrete structures and, sitting with lawyers and understanding the legal side, understanding what they wanted, because it was not the same thing I had learned that I wanted. Yes. So you need to build property, they wanted to make money. Yeah. And but satisfy the clients. But Luis, that that is very similar to when you got you got your, your masters and went straight into the field. Literally straight into the deep end, thought you knew everything like we all do when we come out of college, but actually that the next two or three years after this, you were going to be taught the life lessons of construction on site. But again, it seems to me, you've got to have a, per, a certain personality as well to be able to adapt, be a sponge, take things in and ask the right questions. Did that kind of set you up for this job where you were going to become and literally were given blueprints of, of, of plans and said, listen, go and build it, infrastructure, ground up projects? Well, I believe we're going to probably as the conversation evolved, get to that point uh, where we talk about what pre-construction is, because yeah. when I did it was estimating, it was a different animal, right? Yeah. And you're right, you're correct, yes. But, uh, and, and I have to highlight this, I grew up in a culture that, I, I don't know very well how to put it in words, but w when I met my wife, that she's American, she says, you speak with your body, you speak with your hands and all the time you're moving. And we're like that, we're very expressive. And the way you communicate with people is something that you need to live in a society that is very special. Everybody communicating in a very expressive way, conversations, anecdotes, um, they, they are part of the daily life. So you need to learn how to read people, to understand people in order to do well yes. in that environment, right? And yes, responding to your question, I believe that helped me a lot and it helped me to also, and we have a very special sense of humor too. <laughs> um, that at the beginning I wanted to translate humor, that doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, um, but that helped me to adapt, to change cultures, and uh, to come to this one and start uh, in this area where I'm now, where I have been for almost 20 years now. Uh, but yeah, that helped. 
Brilliant. Because um, I'm just thinking now, straight out of college, straight into a concrete subcontractor, um, worked in in the PM operations side. Then it sounds like a developer side. At what stage or, or was there like a, a moment where you said, you know what, my strengths, my personality, my ability to communicate, my understanding of, of construction, my strength lies within estimating and pre-construction at the beginning of the process? Well, my, my, my wife is a writer and a coach and, and working with one of her clients one day she asked a question that I believe was brilliant, which was, what is the hardest type of change? The change you choose or the change you get? Yes. So, <laughs> and I happened to, uh, at the end of 2000, one of those crises that we had to go through there, I got tired of a lot of things and I left. So, and I landed here and I came with a very clear idea. When you we have such a drastic change like that, where well, you change everything. And, and when I'm saying that, I, I don't mean to exaggerate, but just think that you change languages. And I had the same experience I had with college in the field. I thought, English, I've been studying since I was nine. No problem. Don't worry. <laughs> and I started just, I was going, to, and I, thankfully I landed in California where you always have somebody that speaks Spanish, but I was completely lost. The language was a barrier. Again, the culture, the people don't know better, no worse. It's different. Yes. Just yes. Diff people behave different. They, they interact different. And then in the field where I am, where I am, just think about this. My brain still today works in meters. Wow. If you tell me 70 feet, I divide by three, and I say that's like roughly 20 three meters and I can see the meters from here to there. Yeah, you can you visualize. 17 inches, I do not see the 17 inches. I do not <laughs> see the 17 inches. I need to make times two and a half and then when I go there, it's yeah, like about 60 centimeters, it's like about this, I see that. So I just think that changing all that is a big impact, but when you're coming from, and, and I was aware of that, I, I knew I was willing to do whatever I got. Yes. And, you know, it's hard to get a job and for, for, for all the reasons you can imagine. And I landed in a small GC that happened to need an entry level person and say, I'll, I'll take it. And, and in, in talking in, in, in football terms, you give me the shorts and the cleats and I know I'm going to play a good game. Just yes. let me get in the field. That's all what I wanted it was yeah. And yeah, I was doing pretty much everything they were giving. I was doing kind of a PE, helping PMs, and helping estimating as an assistant, shipping plans at the time, uh, cleaning the, the office, making coffee, whatever. I was yeah. willing to do whatever it took. And, and I go back to your original question that was, it, did it help you to, to have the type of birth totally? Because I never said no to anything. And, and I knew I had to adapt to the system first for them to grow. And then uh, I was, you know, moving towards estimating they needed somebody there. So I started working there. I liked it. I started developing certain things and helping the team. And I go to my original statement. What change is the one that is the hardest, the one you choose or the one you get? And I, got, I happened to be there. Yeah, yeah. That's good. So, a great question. Um, and that was the beginning in, in, in that area. And uh, there was an opportunity. It was a very small company. And an estimating department, we were four people at that time, three, in fact, and grew uh, up to eight when I left that company. And um, that. So I don't want to go beyond. I, I'll let you let you ask me. <laughs> Very good. And th that's it. I mean, you obviously had a strength within estimating. and you could visualize from your field experience, you could visualize projects, you could visualize uh, measurements. Within estimating, obviously, you're, you're, you're working with a couple of top tier general contractors now over the last 12 or 13 years in California. How has it evolved in your eyes, pre-construction and estimating? What has become what has become more important within estimating? Huh. 
that's more a philosophical than a technical question. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that, just think about this. When I started doing estimating uh, back in the 2000s, a uh, uh, few things happened. You were too busy with football at that time, so you don't remember. <laughs> the way, a, estimating was a, 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 a basically technical job. So estimators were receiving documents, were processing the documents, sending out to subcontractors, receiving numbers, doing takeoff, calculating, and putting numbers together, sending them out. If you were low, you were not, you will start over. So. It was a machine, it was basically technical. You were receiving information, processing information, and giving an, an, out, an output. So that was the time uh, in which construction was basically managed through a delivery um, method, ba basically was hard bid. Design, yeah. build, somebody, you have money, you will hire an architect, will design it. Once you have it designed, you will invite, you will private four or five. Here are the drawings, give me a price, the law will get it. That was yeah. the process. As we all know, that was evolving from, eh, that model doesn't work very well because there's always problems in, in the gap between the design and I'm losing money, I'm paying more. So what, how I can improve that? And we're transitioning then we had a crisis in 2007 and 8 that, that, that completely changed the game. And then, but during that process, we had started realizing that there was a better way to do things than in that linear way in which I have the power, I pay you, I pay you. But then if you are two independent people that they work without thinking about each other, I design and I don't care. I build, I, the design is wrong. So what's the better way to do it? And we developed these other um, delivery methods that we can summarize the most important ones we use today is design, build, are, and the most sophisticated one will be IPD, yes. into project delivery. Yeah. So those models, they require something first, are way more dynamic. Yes. Dynamic with all what that means. You're an engineer, you know, it's it, 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 all the parts and pieces interact uh, 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 live simultaneously, and you don't wait in a production line until the end to throw away what is wrong. So you constantly interact, and there's something that is completely essential that is collaboration. There's not collaboration among the, the, the team players, you fail. Yeah. Why am I describing all these? Because the, the, the transformation of the way we procure work and we, we contract and we build things uh, demanded that now what estimating was doing that was putting prices on things now became pre-construction because we need to analyze and interact with the ones that design on daily basis. Yeah provide feedback and advice, and then we need to help them to help us. Yes. So what in estimating was totally essential, that was your technical skill and knowledge about knowing how to read drawings and math and numbers. Now, when we, when we need to collaborate and interact with others, there's another set of skills that is absolutely essential. That are the soft skills. So yeah. if we don't know how to relate to others, how to interact with others, the numbers don't mean anything. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, to I totally agree. And it's, it's changing the face of how uh, senior estimators and pre-construction managers um, work. So historically, and it uh, tells us that estimators were maths people. They sat in the corner, they crunched numbers, and that's it. They were introverts in, in a certain way. But the really good, successful pre-construction managers and estimators right now are a little bit more extrovert. They understand the numbers and they can speak about the numbers from a conceptual point of view. But how they relate with the owner and the architect and the subcontractors is really the, the key gift 
to making sure that a, a project is successful. Um, and try, trying to teach people that or tell people that can be quite difficult. Um, how, how hard, I mean, in your position right now, and this is kind of following on from that point, how hard is it to build and how do you go about building a successful pre-construction team or, or estimating team? Ouch. That, that, that's again, it's a philosophical question. It's not a technical one. Um, look, I believe that all of us, we have gone through classes, seminars, um, trainings about successful team building or, and I believe it's way more simple than what we try to make of that. And I, I'm not saying this from a position of, I know from a way less from uh, speaking from my wisdom because I don't have it. Um, I'm speaking from a position of having failed about trying to apply models or processes or procedures in which that about things that we know and say, well, if you want to have a successful team, you need to go from these, go through these steps, point it. Said in other words, I do not believe in formulas. When it comes about managing, organizing, motivating, and inspiring people, formulas yeah. don't work. For this simple reason, I, I just came up with an example. So just imagine if Pep Guardiola wanted to make play the teams where he went after Barcelona the same way he played with Barcelona. It was impossible. Why? Because he didn't have those players, but more than anything, the combination of those players together. Yeah. You might have an idea about what a team is and how you want it to make work, but if you don't know what you're doing and how you want the members of the team to do that, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. So I went too long on saying what, what I don't believe in, but my uh, this is my opinion, my personal opinion based on my own failures. I believe, I, when I said it's more simple, because I believe that the best way of building a team, the successful part, we'll leave it for a minute there. Yeah. Uh, first, to start building a team is to uh, generate a genuine goal and communicate properly. Okay. Yeah, that so, can, sounds pretty simple. Yeah, but it's not as simple as it sounds. <laughs> but again, it it comes back to the 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 football analogy. If Pep Guardiola has a mission, he has a philosophy. He communicates that mission and philosophy, and that's how he gets his teams to be successful. Um, and and essentially, you're taking that to to. And you're right. There's no right or wrong answer to that. I mean, Pep Guardiola does it differently to Jurgen Klopp. Who does it differently to Jose Mourinho? It's a personal. It's a personal opinion. Um, Correct. Yeah. When I was saying about a genuine goal, I believe certain things that are, are absolutely necessary that we can avoid. And the most important one, uh, the, the the start point is that whatever in what in any industry we're working in, uh, we need to define what our values are, what we believe in. Yeah. So if that is not clear, it's impossible to convey a message to a team. Yes. In my, in my opinion, there's no team that will work without honesty, transparency, and respect. Yes. So those are the foundation. If that doesn't exist, it's impossible to make anything work. And, and if we have clear what our values are, for me, those are the most important ones. And then we can go to something that I personally believe we're all great at something. All of us. Yeah. Finding that is tricky though. But if we can tap into that greatness that every member of a team has and use it first for their own motivation and satisfaction, and then to the benefit of the team, the potential you can achieve is kind of incredible, right? But um, even um, Louis, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But even even no, more no, no, important, even more important than that, if you've got an estimating team that where you've got a really strong mechanical guy, a really strong electrical guy, a really strong civil guy, drywall guy, then if that is their real strengths, they can all learn from each other, so they all become stronger as a group. So yes, yes um, totally. Okay. 
And, and the last thing I would like to say is that if we work as team leaders, it has to be very clear that the interest of the team is always above the individual interest. Okay. And I have failed on this because you know very well that if you score four goals and your team loses 5-4, nobody will remember your four goals. That's right. They, they, they don't really matter. Nobody's going to hug at you and, oh, so I'm, I'm, that's the matter. You lost, right? Yes. But I, I'm not trying to make a point of winning or losing. I'm trying to make the point that in a real team, the success of the team is what matters, not the individual one. And we always have to have that present. We, and in life, that works the same way. Sometimes yeah. think that, oh, alone, I can do. No, we always need the help of somebody uh, to go wherever we want to go. And we need to, keep, that, that has to be very clear too. Good. I love it. Yeah, I like it. And, and again, I, I love the sports analogies because we can take a lot from sports and basically sports can take a lot from the, the corporate world as well. But I really think that, the, I mean, they're, they're my two loves, sport obviously and, and the corporate world. So I love those. Let's quickly switch. Talk yeah. to me about pre-construction technology. How important is it now to your day-to-day -day operation um, and how much of it do you actually use and, and what excites you about it? Is there any tools out there that you guys are using that, that you think, you know what, if this develops a little bit more, this could be a game changer? Well, uh, yes. Uh, I, I believe at this point, um, Peter Gabriel used to say that the only thing that doesn't slow down is the rate of change, right? So we, we can't avoid that. We can't deny that we're evolving and we're changing. And we cannot stay away from that evolution path, right? And in construction, we have to say that we're very special and uh, things have to have a very concrete result in order for us to apply it. But in these days, if we uh, don't accept that fast speed evolution that we're experiencing, we stay behind. Yeah. So uh, there, there's no point in even when, when you try to be in the top of the market, uh, it's impossible because if you keep pushing scales and, you know, prints versus a software that will help you, that will uh, keep you uh, behind. So being that said, um, we have been since, well, in the last 10 years, the, the uh, use of technology have, uh, has radically changed the way we do things. We, we use a process that we internally call continuous cost modeling. So like I said, going from that all rigid model of hard bidding to this design build, you need a more interactive way of proceeding in the way. So you, re, you generate the, the design in Revit, right? 3D uh, software that gives you, this is going to be my project. And then we have another software that's called Assemble that extracts the data and you can manipulate the data in the way you want. Uh, so basically extract quantities with that goes into another estimating software that's called Winnest that with historical cost, we can price the job. So we call it continuous cost modeling because that happens kind of not live, but in a very dynamic and, and fast pace. So as you are designing, you don't need to wait. Like in the old times, they will give you things. You will send 200 questions back. That everything is well. While things are happening in real time. We can say, you know what? I believe we're off. We need to reduce the amount of the skin. We need to change metal panels for this. We need to go to a different um, audiovisual system, the mechanical system, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, is continuous because it happens real time um, and we're modeling something to achieve a, pro a product that the owner wants in, in terms of quality, money, and of course schedule, right? Yeah. So that's what we have been using. 
and we are constantly improving. I said that in the last 10 years, it changed a lot, but I would say in the four or five, yeah, uh, it's very, very, very fast pace. And, yeah. and it's key for what we do. Yeah. It, and I think, I, I think you, you touched, know, I think you touched on it as well. I mean, the, the, the old way of building has completely changed. Design build, there's more control. It's more agile. Everything is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. Literally, the client can come in halfway through the project and change things. You, you do it on assemble, it changes pretty quickly. And it's great to see that technology is keeping up with that. And, and in some cases, technology is actually pushing the guys that are making the decisions to, to, to change. Um, what what do you see in the future? Do you see anything changing in the future? And I, and I know literally, as you say, in the last three or four years, it has changed immensely. Is there anything coming down the line? Um, we, we talk about BIM VDC, the models being the ma the main driver and the main the main focus. Um, do you see that the, the data in the model being shared with the architect and the owner real time? P people being able to to see costs fluctuating. Is that something that, that's going to that's going to happen in the future, or what do you see as the future? Yeah, well, I I, I was uh, blessed and, and and be very privileged to work here in McCarthy because, like I said, we we, we have a, a a huge group of people, and the training for us is very heavy, and I was lucky to uh, have the opportunity to work with a group of young people that their motivation is completely different than 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 ours but i i always was super curious about what was new what was changing what can we do better and i was always open uh to those kind of new ideas i don't have a single doubt that we're pretty close to find something that from the generation of the idea, he can tell you, here it is the number you want in this long. We're going in that direction. Yeah. Uh, I don't know when, a year or two, but now we're using three different pieces of software. At one point, it's going to be one. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, since uh, Revit and this software I told you, Assemble was bought by the, the company that makes Revit. So, they're all integrating into going towards one thing that's gonna simplify the way we do it um, to improve the efficiency and the length of the process and ultimately the quality of the product you obtain within a budget that is always the goal of the, of the owner. However, I would like to say, put a, a couple of things there. Just keep in mind this. When, when, when my son turned 18, he wanted to go to New York. We spent a, a week there. And then I have been so many times in New York, but I had never been to the Empire State. I want to go. Hey, let's go. We went. And we went. You take the tour. All that story. It was fascinating. It was so nice. The pictures were awesome. But what caught my eye is, do you know how long it took to build Empire State? No idea. Yes. Throw a number. It's 2.2 .2 million square feet, 102 floors. Wow. 1931, 1931, 90 years ago. How long? Uh, what number? Um, nine years. 18 months. What? Yes. Right. Yeah, I, I'm going to have a bunch of people that are watching this. I'm going to say, <laughs> how many people die? I mean, true. Absolutely. Like, wow. like the software changed, safety changed, a lot of things changed. Now, we just started construction for a college, for an institutional building, 52,000 square feet. It's a concrete frame, but 52,000, two stories. Okay. And now we're closing the proposal that we're submitting in, in 10 days. Another 56, same thing, but three stories, steel frame, like the Empire State Building. This three-story steel frame, 56,000 square feet. Guess how much is the schedule? 53. I would say the same time frame. 27 months. Wow. So, you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah. We have made progress in certain areas. Yes. But, uh, we have 
apply the changes that we didn't have any other options than doing it. Yeah, yeah. So, but our industry has stayed behind in the terms of using technology uh, uh, in, in the proper way to our own advantage. Yeah, and, not a critique. Yeah, and so go ahead. And, and touching on that, is prefabrication the future? Do, do you like that? Do, 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 does McCarthy use that? Do, do you? Well, well, yeah, we do. For, for high rise buildings, you use a lot of prefabrication. You, you have modules, bathrooms, hospitals that they're pre mounted in the yard of the plumber and the being, and you put it in, and prefabrication for skin. Uh, uh, the curtain walls are prefabricated, and precast panels are prefabricated. But the, the prefabrication has a limit. You yeah. can prefabricate yeah. a structure. Yeah, there are uh, steel structures that are more functional in terms of going faster, uh, um, you know, so many, I don't want to say the names, but uh, you have a limit. Mm -hmm. You cannot build the Burj Khalifa uh, offside in the precast. Yeah, yeah. You cannot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or in prefab is one solution, but um, yeah, it's not revolutionary. Yeah, I, no, I understand. It's it's a bit it's a big talk talking point at the moment. That's why I was I wanted to kind of touch on it. Yeah. Um, so give me an idea, Louis. Now you're in California. We relocate a lot of people, estimated pre-construction guys, all over the U.S., but California being one of them. What do you do to relax? What do you do to get away from the, the crazy world that is, apart from watching football, um, although you probably, do, do you still, you obviously watch Argentina. Do you have an Italian team that you follow? How, what do you do to relax? Well, <laughs> what do I do to relax? I do a lot of things to relax. <laughs> because I, I firmly believe that a balanced life is the only one that allows us to have a clear brain. So if the body doesn't feel well, the brain doesn't is not well. So I'm very heavy on, on sports. Like you said, I played since I was young. I play soccer, I was a goalie, not, not good at all. <laughs> a lot of tennis too. I, I practice a lot of things. And for the, in the last couple of decades, uh, I had been running, swimming a lot. And lately I changed to biking. And that's the one I, I spend the most of the time uh, on. So uh, again, I have the privilege to work in an area. Our office is in an area that is pretty close to the beach. We are in the back bay in Newport Beach. So I can ride my bike at lunch. Nice. Bring vehicle, and those are my breaks. I, I'm a very early guy. So I come early or I ride it early in the morning or at lunch. I do that. I do that on the weekends too. Uh, we spend a lot of time with my wife. We love to travel. Mostly sports are the ones that gives me, I wouldn't say the peace, but kind of the balance I need to recharge my batteries. And um, I, I can avoid, like you said, you know, I won't deny it, that when the last World Cup, I told my wife, now finally I can say, I'm totally over it. I'm going to relax, watch all the games. <laughs> at all and at one point she's what are you doing she's walking by me and says what do you mean you said you were relaxed you're sitting in the edge of uh. the <laughs> so, blood pressure is up here yeah it's it's right it's well i you heard me mentioning you know i still have the picture of the soccer that guardiola played with barcelona when he was there that's the idea that is kind of if you think i don't want to be biased but it's a combination of the Argentinian uh, Brazilian soccer, touching yeah. the ball a lot, rolling the ball a lot, and letting the talent shine. Yeah, huge influence. And 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 he, I mean, you can you can even go back to Johan Cruyff and, and, and people like that within the Barcelona hierarchy. But yes, I totally. agree with you. Yeah, he, he was I, the one that, that he, he was, but it's it like construction. Johan Cruyff like took it a little bit. But I think Guardiola like took it the further, the further seventy percent. Johan Cruyff came, give, given the blueprint. Obviously, he was putting it through the academy, so the players in the academy were playing that way. 
But then once uh, Guardiola got them at 16, 17, 18, then he brought he brought them to his philosophy, which was even more tic tac and, and possession. -based. Yeah, I, I heard him saying something brilliant once. Says, you know, going back to building a team, you need to be absolutely clear about the message of what you want. You need to kill yourself in the practice, and on game day, go and shine. Relax. Because yeah. asking, what do you tell Messi? Nothing. <laughs> I tell him nothing. So. We during the, the week we talk about what kind of game we want to play, and on that day he has to do what he knows the best, use his yeah. talent. That's it. Yeah. So and that's a fantastic message. Um, it's so, like, it's like the hard the hard work is done between Monday and Friday, and then the on game day and Saturday, the the, the managers that are on the sideline on a Saturday roaring and shouting, then it's too late. You're roaring and shouting, trying to get a message across that you should have got. And again, it comes back to construction. If you are in the operations team, senior project manager, project executive, roaring and shouting about things are not right and not right, it should have been done during pre-construction. And that's why it's why we work on pre-construction. It is the fundamental area that is going to increase and has the biggest impact on making a, a project successful. Well, you asked me what, what things have changed and, and in pre-construction, I'll go back and I'll combine a couple of concepts all together. Um, one of the things that have changed, I believe we went from this idea that estimating a pre-construction was a necessary evil uh, to this idea that if we don't study a project properly, if we don't analyze the risk and the variables that are included efficiently and if as a conclusion of all that analysis we don't price it properly we are never going to be able to build it properly right yeah. so and, and 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 that has a lot to do with the concept of building a team that's why we need to have clear what we have to do how we want to do it philosophically convey that message properly but then let the people do what they know best. And I would like to add, you, you, you mentioned analogies, another monster coach for me, completely different than Guardiola, from another school, okay. but I like immensely, that is uh, Marcelo Bielsa. Yes. Um, and he said once, something, hopefully I don't, I don't change his words, but he said, and that's related to uh, the success of a team, and applies to construction and every industry. A success in a team has nothing to do with victory, but with the nobility of the resources we use in the search of a goal. Wow. So uh, that, that says everything because he says that if you kill yourself, again, what we were saying, we leave everything you have. A victory is an accident as it is a loss. There are things in life, in construction and on every field, that we cannot control. Yeah. What we control is to do things with honesty, transparency, and respect, and leave everything we have. Now, a car can cross in front of us, we can have an accident, we didn't make it, we didn't deliver the bid, we threw to the trash seven weeks of work, right? We cannot control that, but we can control that we make the best effort. You work like an animal for seven, six days, like you said. You train, you left everything, you didn't eat, you didn't sleep. You dominated, you had the ball for 80% of the game. Somebody missed the ball last <laughs> goal, you lost. Who's gonna remember your effort? But that's what it happens, right? And in this business, it's the same. And, and I always tell the people that I work with that the most important for me is that you're honest and transparent, that you show me and you give me the best, you're willing to do better, good and better, and the rest will happen. Yes, that's right. Yeah, no, right? totally agree with you. I love it. I love the philosophy. I love the, the two people that you picked out. I never thought we were going to be discussing Marcelo Belesi on this podcast, but I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he has certain things, but the, the respect I have for the guy, because yeah. he giving up everything for his principles that's right 
Eve's and, like, like you know. And, and they have remained the same for his whole career, and he's still doing well with Leeds. Love it. Louis, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your stories. Um, I would love to do it again, maybe in 12, 16 months to get an idea of, of where we're at, but I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Um, I, I really enjoy this, as you can tell. I like to, I like to speak, I like to talk. And I like anecdotes and uh, whatever I can help with, you know, just sharing my experience because we are always learning. We never stop learning. That's what I believe. And um, hopefully we can keep learning from each other. It's been my pleasure and it will be my pleasure to, in the future, do it again. We'll Thank keep in. Love it. Thank you, Luis. Speak to you soon. Thank you.